Today we'll provide a brief introduction to transposition of the great arteries. Normally, the pulmonary artery and the aorta are at 90 degrees from each other. So this is a normal heart, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, normal blood flow to the lungs and to the aorta. This is normal. We'll discuss D, transposition of the great arteries, and L, transposition of the great arteries. In both the aorta and the pulmonary artery are, par are parallel. In D, transposition, the aorta is anterior and typically to the right of the uh, pulmonary artery, whereas in L transposition, the aorta is anterior and to the left of the pulmonary artery. Okay, here's the rest of the heart here, and we'll orient you here in a moment. Okay, so a blue blood cell will come from the upper body lower body to the right atrium, cross the tricuspid valve, which is always associated with the corresponding ventricle, to the right ventricle, and then go out to the aorta. And pulmonary venous return to the left atrium, the left ventricle, out to the lungs. Okay, this is detransposition. With L transposition, you have blue blood coming from the upper body, lower body to the right atrium, but now it crosses the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then goes out to the back to the lungs, to the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary venous return comes to the pulmonary veins and left atrium, crosses the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle out to the aorta. So in detransposition, we have atrioventricular concordance, but ventricular arterial discordance. In L transposition, you have atrioventricular discordance and ventricular arterial discordance. Two wrongs make a right because blue blood finds its way to the lungs. This is why some people have called this congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries, and some people also call this ventricular inversion, where the ventricles have traded positions, although some anatomists may take issue with this name. So going back to D transposition, you can see that this is not a situation that is compatible with long-term survival unless there's an opportunity for mixing. And so, um, you want to keep the PDA open early in life to buy some time when you do that with prostaglandin. And sometimes what you have to do is an atrial septostomy, inflating a balloon, come from below, inflating a balloon across the atrial septum, pulling it back and enlarging an atrial septal defect to allow a mixing of red and blue blood uh, so that you can uh, get to the next stage. Now, currently, the operation of choice is the arterial switch operation for most patients, unless there's associated complicated anatomy. And the arterial switch, here's the arterial switch. As the name implies, switching these arteries around, but you also have to move the coronary arteries, which is why this operation um, uh, took a long time uh, to be uh, developed and refined. Dr. Adib Jatin in 1975 was the first to perform it, and it wasn't until you know the, the, the mid to late 80s that it became universally adopted by most centers. So the, uh, the arterial switch looks something like this. <laughs> 
the arterial switch. Coronary arteries have been moved from here to here. Coronary anomalies are very common in patients with D transposition, and this can complicate the moving of the uh, coronary arteries. And here you have a situation where blue blood goes to the lungs and you've reestablished ventricular arterial uh, uh, concordance and the red blood comes to the left ventricle and you have a systemic left ventricle out to the aorta. Now you can imagine how reimplantation re difficulties with the coronaries can uh, can be a barrier and cause uh, complications in the short and long term that require monitoring. Anastomosis of the pulmonary arteries and the uh, and the aorta can uh, narrow. The neo aorta can dilate. Realize this is pulmonary valve tissue and it can dilate, and that's very common long term. And you can also have crowding, vascular crowding in the chest, and you can have a pulmonary artery, uh, branch pulmonary artery stenosis. All these things require follow-up, and this is the arterial switch operation. Before the arterial switch could be performed, Dr. Senning in the 50s and Dr. Mustard in the 60s um, uh, refined the atrial switch operation. And the atrial switch operation named the, for, for the Senning or the Mustard, depending on the specific modification, looks something like this. So in this situation, you have a diversion of blood flow, a baffling of blood flow from the systemic veins, from the SVC and the IVC over to the mitral valve and the left ventricle and pulmonary venous blood flow thereby goes around these baffles, these tunnels if you will, to the systemic, now systemic right ventricle aorta. And so here you have blue blood here, here going to the subpulmonic left ventricle, out to the pulmonary arteries, and pulmonary venous return comes to the pulmonary veins and goes across the systemic tricuspid valve. Always the uh, valve follows the ventricle, right ventricle to the systemic right ventricle to the aorta. You can imagine some of the long-term complications associated with this situation. Number one, you have the right ventricle doing the left ventricle's job, a systemic right ventricle. Little horse doing big horse's job. And so attention and follow-up to the right ventricle function and the tricuspid valve, which can uh, regurgitate as the right ventricle enlarges, uh, those are uh, things that require close attention. Narrowing in the uh, baffle, leaks in the baffles are all things that require attention. Uh, and the narrowing can occur on the systemic uh, side, but also on the pulmonary venous side, causing, causing pulmonary uh, hypertension. And the, the sinus node lives about here, and so you can imagine how sinus node dysfunction because of scarring near and around the uh, sinus node can cause this. So sinus node dysfunction, baffle problems, and systemic right ventricle, uh, systemic right ventricle uh, uh, dysfunction, systemic tricuspid valve regurgitation are all long-term complications of the atrial switch operation, the mustard and the Senning operation. Now back to congenitally corrected transposition. With congenitally corrected transposition or L transposition, we agree that two wrongs make a right and that blue blood finds its way to the lungs, which is the, which is normal. The problem is you have a systemic right ventricle. Again, little horse doing the big horse's job. And so attention and follow up to the systemic right ventricle uh, function and, uh, and the associated uh, tricuspid valve uh, regurgitation. Um, 
Epstenoid tricuspid valves, congenitally malformed tricuspid valves are common with congenital corrective transposition, but also the uh, right ventricle because of dilation and hypertrophy can distort the tricuspid valve apparatus as well as annular dilation causing tricuspid valve regurgitation. So these are also things require follow-up. Ventricular septal defect is a common association uh, with uh, congenital corrective transposition, L-transposition, and AV node dysfunction, uh, high incidence and uh, of requiring a pacemaker in one's lifetime when they have congenitally corrected transposition. Some have proposed performing a surgery to restore the systemic left ventricle function. And that, that would be performed with something called the double switch operation. And the double switch operation, as the name implies, uses both the ar uh, uh, arterial switch and the atrial switch for this, uh, in an effort to correct this, this is an area of uh, debate. That's obviously not a one-size-fits-all and goes beyond the scope of this introduction.